two realms, you know, the spirit realm and then the natural realm. And in the spirit, in the natural realm, uh, the enemy operates in the realm of uh, bondage. He wants to put us in bondage of something. He is, he is, uh, that's, that's his classic operation. And Jesus said, I've, I've come, you know, you shall know the truth, truth shall set you free. So there's freedom. But freedom doesn't, it's not just a, uh, a gift that comes without condition because the, the freedom comes through I mean, we're free from, from uh, guilt and shame when we're saved. You know, we're free from that, from the guilt. But in the natural realm, there are a number of areas in our life that has to have to be managed. And Susan's bringing up one here. There, we are all, we are all, have been all victimized. Things have happened to us. And we have to deal with that in a biblical way. And the, and the primary way that we deal with that is through forgiveness. The devil always destroy, defeats us by bringing us, pointing us back to the, past or he points to the and that's where he deals with because they're memories and but the memories are not the biggest problem the me, the memories are connected to an emotion and the emotions are the power of life that's what i teach and uh, the the power in when you're if you've not embraced and believed god for for your forgiveness see forgiveness then you walk in guilt and shame you can never have the joy of the lord if you're in that if people have an everybody is a victimized by somebody people People do dumb stuff to us, right? I mean, that just is, you know, welcome to the planet. People do stuff to us. And, uh, but the greatest act of, of humanity and the greatest act of eternity is one thing. What is it? Forgiveness. Everybody say forgiveness. That's the, that is the entire Bible. I'll tell you again. If we say this Bible is about one thing, give me one word. It is it's forgiveness. Now, we could say love or God or, and all those things, but uh, the love of God, because God loved, so loved the world, he sent his only son. Why? To die on the cross. Why? So we might be forgiven. So the whole thing's about, but it's a, it is such a vital central issue that Jesus said, if you don't forgive others, neither will you be forgiven. Now, that's how, that's how direct Jesus was with that forgiveness. So for anybody to harbor forgiveness and not and not release that, they are in bondage. That is definition of bondage. Because you maintain that person's power over you, and that's what it's doing. It's giving that person, whoever it might be, rent-free space in your brain, and the thought is, they did this to me. That's the victimhood model. Everybody's victimized, but when you do not forgive, you will live in victimhood. And you, can, you cannot find the joy of the Lord. You'll be kind of just, you know, you just can't find that. There's no dance. There's no bounce in your step. There's, even your, the countenance of your face won't look like you're saved. You're just like, oh, you know, they did this to me and I'm going to do that. And without, without dealing with that, that's, what you, that's the word. It's, 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 a, it's a baggage. It's bondage. It's, you're carrying that. How, why? Your own choice. And when we choose not to follow the principles of God's word, the principles of God's word, then we wind up in bondage every time. Everybody that comes in the counseling, they're all in bondage of one sort or another. And, the, and it's not, the idea is, the, it's, a, it's an interaction between two people, something happened, and it's an event, but the event becomes a memory, and the memory connects to the emotion that, and here's what it is, it's, uh, the power of life is in your emotions. Resentment, bitterness, anger, could be shame, could be guilt, that's about me, the other's about the other person, and I transfer to that person power over my emotions. And I say, I'm not going to let go. Why? Because they don't de deserve to be forgiven, because they did this to... Me, 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 And you say, I'm going to give them authority over me to control my emotions. And that's the insanity of it, but it's the deception of it. And ultimately, it is bondage. Hallelujah. So there's the word. Just let it go. Turn to somebody and say, maybe, it's my, maybe that's the person. Say, let it go. Let it go. Let it go. How many have never been offended in this life? You've never been offended. How many of you? Okay, good. I mean, that's just how it goes. It, you know, in, in the whole thing, I'm going to, the whole thing comes back to one word or two things. It comes back to the love of God and it comes back to the cross.
It comes back to me going to that cross and dying to and dying to self and getting, remember I put, I was doing the thing on the fullness of the spirit and I had the big glass thing here and I had the stones inside of it and then you pour the water in it, it comes to the top, you say, is it filled with the, is it filled with the spirit? Well, not really, it's filled, but I'd like to get more in there, but I got to get something, I got to get me out to get more Holy Spirit in. I, I, I need, the fullness of the spirit is directly related to my emptiness, but on those rocks, those stones in that glass thing there, what they re represent is some kind of sin. Unforgiveness is sin, right? Worry. Is worry sin? Because yes. Jesus said, do not worry. take no thought for tomorrow. God's going to take care of it. I am going to worry. What is that? That's looking to the... And it's based upon the emotion of fear. What if? What if this happens? What if that happens? Oh, it's fear of the future. The Lord says, today's got enough trouble of its own. I'm going to take care of your tomorrow. And we, we should say, okay, I'm unloaded there. Thank you. Now I'm in freedom. I can worship the Lord because God's got everything in control of my life. This is the, we walk not by sight, but we walk by faith. I walk by faith. That's, that's, that's how the kingdom works. Now there's the struggle, though. That's the struggle of, of our Christian walk. Because we're all struggling with that. But if we don't have the concepts and we don't understand the dilemma, we can't get freedom. Because the de devil's too good at deceiving us and getting us to justify why this person did it to me and they don't deserve it, you know, they are. And then, and then we say, unless they come to me and resolve this, I'm not going to let them go. And we're wrong because we're operating in self-life. There it is. Amen. That's good. We ought to go home now. That was a good message. Thank you, Susan, for starting that. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> and then? He said, if you make the decision to forgive this man, I will help you by my grace to forgive this man. And I thought, oh, that's easy. All I have to do is make a decision. So I made the decision. And then I said, okay, I made the decision to forgive this man. Well, it was no time we were back to dinner. Who's greeting everybody at the door? This man. Freedom. Freedom. Yes. I got home and God said to me, He said, I want you to start praying for that man. He said, That man is not saved. And I want you to start praying for Good. This whole family was not saved. Good. I started praying for that man. And his wife told me, My dear husband said he wanted to go to church. And I said, Well, what? She said, Well, what church would you go to if you went to a church? And he remembered. Now that's a good testimony there, Miss Dot. Wow. What does it say? To obey is better than sacrifice. See, it's, and I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. Some think this way, this is the deception. I, well, I'll forgive them when I feel like it. See, this feelings, that's, that's the carnality. I'll, I'll forgive them when, they, when, when I feel like it. Or when they come to me, then I might forgive them. But then again, I might not. I don't know. But when you move in the spirit realm, and this is key, when you say, no, I'm going to choose to forgive them. There's, there's a couple things are going on here. A God honors that because the feelings that associated with the offense are a bit of a problem. 
If somebody did something really bad to you, you're going to now feel something about that. And now it's a choice. Do you forgive that person? I use this, this story, which is a true story about a woman who she was raped by this guy. She was raped by him. Now, you talk about an offense. Raped by this guy, and she was carrying this burden. She was bitter. She was angry, resentful. She just, no joy. She's a Christian. And this guy and the Lord spoke to her and said, go to that prison over there and go there and get a meeting with God, this guy and look through the glass and look him in the eye and say, sir, this was a terrible offense in my life but I've chosen to forgive you. And looking at that guy, he immediately broke down in tears. He just broke because it set him free. And subsequent to that, he was at the church service and gave his heart to the Lord because the woman made a choice to forgive, not feeling like he was whatever. It's just obedience. To obey is better. When you obey the Lord in that way, it, it's... He will then come and His grace will be upon you to move through that emotionally, mentally and emotionally, and find freedom. And the other is this. When you hold something against someone else, you are holding back the move of God on that person's life, right? In other words, there, um, John 20, 23, I think it says, And he who sins that you forgive, they are forgiven. But he who sins are retained, they are retained. You say, oh, what's that mean? When somebody has done something to you, wife or husband, whoever, could it be on the job, they're, until you, they would want to forgive, but maybe they don't even, they're not even thinking about it. When you go to that person, as Dorothy's saying, I, I want to just let you know that I was offended by whatever, and I'm just coming to say, I forgive you for that transgression, or there's a, there's a breach between the two. When you say that to them, that sets them free. Because up until that point, they are in bondage. They're in the bondage to this spiritual dynamic, and you're retaining their sin. You say, I'm retaining your sin. Until, or whatever, what the conditions are. No, by obedience we go say, I forgive. And we could do that just, you know, the person may be someplace else. You just do it in your heart. But the best thing is when you go to that person, you look them in the eye, and, and you resolve it. If your brother has ought, to, ought against you, do what? You go to that brother and you look him in the eye and say, we're going to resolve this. But forgiveness is the key of life. It's the key. It's what sets the captives free. Here's another example. Maybe we'll preach on forgiveness today. If that's okay, we'll preach on that, Lord. That's okay. I got folks that sit there and they uh, have done these things in their past. And they say, uh, well, uh, all that's said and good and salvation and everything. But I've done this, that, and the other thing bad. And I can't forgive myself. I can't forgive myself. I said, is that true? Now think of what you just said. I can't forgive myself. Now, the answer to that is you're absolutely correct. You can't do anything to get forgiveness. But someone came and gave their life and died on that cross. So the question is not whether you can forgive yourself. The question is whether you by faith accept and receive forgiveness from the one who gave his life. That's the subject. The subject here is one, because they want, oh, I can't forgive myself. And I said, well, how, how am I going to help you forgive yourself? How do I would do that? Or just try harder to forgive yourself? That's not the answer. The, I said, the problem you have is one of sin. Here's your sin. It's the sin of unbelief. Did Jesus die on the cross and shed his blood and pay for your sin? Yes. Are your sins forgiven? Yes. Okay, where do we derive then, I can't forgive myself? The issue is, do you accept Christ's forgiveness? And if you do, you say amen, and you put a period on it. I am forgiven. And the, then you've got to know how little spiritual warfare, because the devil is called, one of his titles in Revelation 12, 10 is, he is called the uh, accuser of the brethren. And he said he accuses the saints of God before God day and night. Now that's not, he's not in God's face. It's before God, God's watching this happen on earth. He says, and when he accuses you, he brings you to your past. And he says, you are still guilty. So now you got to know, how, how, do, how do you deal with that? Well, Revelation 12, 11 says, and they overcame the accuser by the blood of the Lamb. 
and the word of their love, not their life. It's the it's the triad of victory. But the first one is this. It's the blood of the lamb. So every time the devil comes and says, yeah, but back here, you did. You say, stop right there. You lying demon. He said, because the blood of Jesus paid the blood, the blood, the blood, the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus. You want to send demons screaming. That's what you say. The blood of Jesus paid for that sin, you lying devil. And it's done. See, it's, we're in freedom. I don't have to forgive myself. I just have to accept the act that Christ did on that cross. And it's amen. And that's it. Amen. So be it. So it's a little spiritual warfare worked into the whole thing. Amen. Oh, that's good preaching right there. See what you started, Susan? <laughs> but we do want to be led by the Spirit, right? 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 Amen. We want to be led by the Spirit. So we just go where the Spirit leads us. And that's one of the, uh, you know, there's a number of things that the Spirit of God does. But it says, Romans 8, 14. I have six sheets here now. Bob, did you ever see somebody preach from six? Have you ever done six Notes. I've got six <laughs> sheets of notes. And I've got 10 minutes. That's it. Be fast. But I got a, I got a, just a, a kind of a revelation last night on this. And it's the simplest revelation, but it's so vitally important. Because we're talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, right? You shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit comes. He said, Jesus said, don't go any place until you get the power. We've studied, this is the third week, by the way, we've been studying this. We talked about Pentecost and Pentecost was the, they call it the, uh, the ingathering. That was Pentecost. It was the feast of the ingathering, bringing in the harvest, bringing in the harvest. Think about this, how prophetic it is. And, the, and they said, don't go any place until you receive power, the infilling the baptism, the fullness of the Spirit. He said, don't go anyplace. Why? Because you need that to go out and do the harvest. It's just about the harvest. When Jesus was ministering, you know, he was 30 years old. And uh, he's now, you, you, then you qualify as a, a rabbi. And he goes uh, out there and he's, he doesn't start his ministry to his 30. Guess what happens? He goes down into, here's John the Baptist. John the Baptist says, uh, you know, the, this is the greater one. I'm not... Worthy to tie his sandals, he comes down into the Jordan and he baptizes him. And out from heaven comes what? Hold the Spirit of God. And, and it fills him. Now, I don't understand that. That's God coming on God. But it's about Jesus' humanity and, his, and it is his, uh, uh, the, the model he's given. He's given us a, uh, an example of how the whole thing works. The Holy Spirit comes upon him, then he goes. But he goes, that says the Spirit of God led him into the wilderness, and he's got, a, he's got the conflict with the enemy to, to uh, dissuade him and to re, you know, push him away and get him to go in another direction. So that once you get filled with the Spirit, the point being there, that a lot of times you, have, you enter into another level of, of conflict with the enemy. Okay? Uh, that's just classic stuff. If you want to just... Mm, just be a kind of a mediocre, lukewarm Christian. You won't have as much conflict, but when you step over the line, you want to join up. It's like getting in the army, you know. Well, if you're not in the army, you're not going to go fight with the enemy. But once you're in the army, now you've got some conflict going on. And that's what Jesus gave us that role model. And then he says, now, I'm going back to the Father. And when I get back there, the Father's going to send the promise. I'll, I'll send you the, 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 the baptism, the fullness. And, uh, and he said, that's what you're going to get the power. And when you get the power and the question is, what is the power exactly? And I was thinking about that. How I, mean, I know when I was filled with the Holy Spirit, I, I was a changed person. I, there was something moved me from where I was into other ministry things. And, and of course, that's when went into the ministry and Kathy and I went and pioneered the church and, you know, all the ministry prisons for many, many years. Uh, all of that ministry was was a result of the, of the fullness, or we say the baptism of, of the Holy Spirit. So what, what exactly happened there? But it was, all of this is Pentecost. Pentecost is the, is the harvest. If you get that, he said, this is about the harvest. And we are in now something called the church age or the age of the Gentiles. And he said, you are now my people. 
you are sent out into this harvest, but do not go. He said, wait till the Holy, you know, till you get the fullness of the spirit, because then everything will make sense to you. And uh, so here we are and we have opportunity. Think about which we're, we're studying the Shekinah glory of God, right? The Shekinah glory is the presence of God. Where was the presence of God first seen in, in, in you know, manifestation clearly? And it was up on a mountain, but it was in the first, uh, the tabernacle in the wilderness, right? And there's the uh, Ark of the Covenant. And there's the manifestation is right in right above the mercy seat between the cherubim. And then there's the, the, the pillar of smoke and there's a fire in the middle. And it's the manifest presence in the temple. Well, then they had temples over the years. Uh, Solomon's temple, it said when, when it was all done, they had this great prayer. He prays. They got all when everybody, when all the worshipers were one, when all the people were one, the cloud of the glory shows up in the temple. Amen. And then it says in Acts 2, and they were all together and they became one. And they're in the upper room and they became one. Something about that, the unity. But it was not just, well, we're, we're friends. They were waiting. They were expecting. They were in faith saying, what we're, we're expecting God to come and fill this so that we then can be part of the plan of God and move out in the glory and the plan of God to touch the planet. Well, then where does the, where, now the temples are destroyed. Now, uh, Solomon's temple, they rebuild it, you know, and uh, under Ezra and Zerubbabel and all that. And, uh, but then, then the next temple comes. Now, the next temple is Jesus. He is the temple. And the, and the Spirit of God is no longer in actually the building. Herod's temple, there's no glory there because there's no, there's no, uh, there's no ark. There's no ark of, of the covenant. It's not the same. There's no cloud pillar, but the Holy Spirit is in Jesus. And he is now manifesting. The, he is the Shekinah glory, right? And say, well, how do, you, how do we know that? Because he goes to the Mount, of, Mount Hermon, probably. And he goes up there. And for a moment, he pulls back the veil. In Hebrews, it says, and the veil was his flesh. Jesus is the temple. The Shekinah glory of God is in him. It's in him. He's carrying it. It came from heaven. The glory, the presence of the spirit of the living God is in the is in this uh, uh, in his in that body was prepared for him. It's in there. And he goes up on the mountain and in some miraculous event, he pulls back the veil for a minute. And you have something called the what? The transfiguration. And he said that the thing was so bright, it was like brighter than the sun and all of this. He said it's so bright. It was the Shekinah. It's the glory of God. And Jesus is going about doing the work of his father. Okay, that's the next step. Okay, the father, the, here's the glory in the wilderness. There's there. The, the Jesus comes. The glory is on him. He demonstrates to the world what the father is like. As he ministers and he cares for others. And he says, I'm giving you a visual, a picture. And we read it in the Bible. We read all of the events. He was our... He was our the, the forerunner. He was, uh, he was the example. The one that we look to, he said, how many want to be like Jesus? You know, he said, we want to be more like Jesus. Want to be? Okay, we read it in here and we see what he did. He said, I do nothing except I see the, I'm going to see the Father do it. I'm going to, why? He's being led by the, is that All right? Oh, oh. Romans 8, 14, for as many as are led by the Spirit. They're the sons of God and daughters, but that's who they are. He said, you're, you're being led by the Spirit. Why? Because you're a son of God. What, what does he lead you to do exactly? Well, there's a variety of things, but primarily he leads us into some level of ministry. Whatever our assignment is, we get an assignment. And, but in the earth we are, in Philippians it says, we are lights and beacons. We are the Shekinah glory in a dark and perverse nation. And that really applies to what we have today. Okay. So now, okay, the Lord goes back to heaven. He said, it's better I go. Because I'm just like one person here and I'm doing all this stuff. But when I go, I'm going to send the promise of the Father. This whole, Holy Spirit's coming. I like to use Holy Spirit rather than the Holy Spirit. He's got a number of names. He's called Comforter. The Greek word is paraclete. He says he's the comforter. He's the guide. He does a number of things. He said, I'm going to send this one. And this one is going to be in my church. Acts 2.39, it says, For the promise, which is the Holy Spirit, is unto you 
It's unto your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call his own. He said, this little, this promise of the Holy Ghost is for all of my people. And, uh, okay, well, we've got a problem there. Uh, the problem is that, you know, understanding that we are now indwelt, we are now the temple, right? We are the temple of the Holy Spirit individually and corporately. It says we are as living stones being built up as a temple of God for praise unto the Lord. So now we're the temple. Temple in the wilderness, and now Jesus was the temple. He said, now you're the temple. And my Shekinah glory, you're going to carry the glory. It says, Christ in you, the hope of what? Glory. So that is the, that's what we carry. But until we are filled with the Spirit, there's a diminishing. We don't have the, say, the fullness of the manifestation that, is, that we're looking for. So this is individual, and it's also corporate. Here's the problem it has arisen over, over time. And uh, first uh, Timothy three, it says, you know, here's the, the spirit expressly says in the latter times, all this stuff is going on and, uh, you know, the wickedness of man. And then it goes at the end and it says something very unique. He said they will the church, the people will have a form they will have a form of godliness, but they will deny the, the power. Now, that's what we see has come down through the ages. And the fullness, the baptism, the indwelling, whatever you call it, has come under question. And it's virtually ignored in the church, and yet it's the power of God. I say, if I were the devil, what I would do is come up with a doctrine called cessationism. Cessationism means that baptism of the Holy Spirit is no longer for today. That has, that has been something in the past. That was just a little jump start for the church, you know, coming out of uh, Pentecost and get it going. But after that, we don't need it. Now, you talk about a doctrine that doesn't make any sense at any level, much less the spiritual level. And yet it is the power of God. That's what it is. I didn't have the power. I was a Lutheran. I didn't have any power. I wouldn't even save, much less. But it was a form of godliness. We had a very, very well-defined form. We had, a, we had a, a song book, and in there, there was a, a service. It was one service, and we did the same thing every Sunday. Different song, but the same service. Then there was a second service. We only did that like once every six months. It was like, wow, a second service, a, se a different words? Incredible. And then we'd recite a bunch of stuff, and that was it. It was a form. And then got saved, hallelujah, that's, uh, that was good. Got a little more something, you know, obviously you get saved, you're, now you're born again, you're, you're, now, you're can, now you're spiritual so you can start understanding what the Bible's about. Because the natural man, people say, well, I don't understand the Bible. Well, you need to get saved because the natural man doesn't understand the things of the Spirit. If you say you don't understand the Bible, you need to be saved because the, the Spirit of God will reveal this to you because that's what he does. He leads us and he teaches us, right? So then uh, I said, boy, this, I, we got hooked up with this uh, charismatic home group kind of thing. And they were worshiping God. They had the joy of the Lord. Young people, you know, they're just worshiping God. And uh, by the way, that's happening in, right now in uh, California. There's a big move of God going on there. Just on there, a young woman and her, and her husband was, they were in, uh, let me mark my place here to come back to where I was at. But they're, they're uh, uh, living in a big, nice hotel, big jobs in New York City. The Lord spoke to them and said, sell everything you have and go to and go to uh, California, start a ministry. And I'm sure they are full with the Holy Spirit when she testified. But you can tell she's got so much joy. They go there. They start on the beach, on the beach. They, they've had already over 2,500 people saved. Then they develop discipleship groups. They go to the beach. They got videos of it. They are getting baptized right in the ocean. They're worshiping God. It was like the Jesus movement days back in the in the 70s and 80s, 60s, 70s, when the charismatic, they're on the beach there. They're like loving Jesus, getting baptized and saved. Then Mario Murillo's out there. He's got thousands in his tent out there. They're descending on Sacramento. Big things happening over in California. We may have a wait for a while before it gets, you know, moves over to the east here. But there's something, young people, right? So we go to the young people thing. Oh, baptism of the Holy Ghost. I said, I never heard such a thing. I'm like the Ephesian church, you know, we've never heard such a thing as a, we'd have, we did not know there was a Holy Ghost. Well, I didn't know. I mean, I, we prayed prayers, you know, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. I didn't know what the Holy Spirit was or it was or whatever. 
Oh, it's a, it's a he. It's actually a, it's actually a he. John 16, 13 through 4. However, when he, the Holy Spirit, comes, he will guide you in the truth. He will speak of, a, not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you the things to come. That's prophecy. And he's a he. He's Holy Spirit. He can be grieved. He can be quenched. And there are some, you know, like the uh, witnesses, Jehovah's Witnesses, they think it's an it. It's just like the force out there. It's just kind of force. It just kind of influences people. And they, and they didn't read the Bible, I guess. Or they changed it. Who knows? And, uh, and I said, what, what is this? I said, I, need, I think I need that because I don't have the joy that I couldn't raise my hands. I could maybe... A little, oh, a little air, but nothing much going on. You know, I'm like a half staff, you know, and I couldn't even get. And then, so I went to the service. I told you my testimony and on a field and of 50,000 people in the Jesus um, back in those days, late 70s. And the Holy Spirit filled me there and said, oh, from then on, everything changed. Every, everything in my life and our life changed. And he launched us in the ministry to reach thousands of people. I used to have a, at the Civic Center, we, I ran... A ministry with thousands were coming to this ministry and in auditoriums all across the, that area there, thousands were coming to the Lord. I didn't know. I'm just little Eddie from Oradell, New Jersey. You know, what, what, whatever. He said, no, I'll use you. I just need a willing vessel. That's all. But if you're willing to get filled, I'll, I'll use you. But there's conditions to that. And, uh, and one of the big uh, things is this. I, I, he's going to fill us if we're willing to obey. And that's one of the big thing, how to receive. He said, uh, uh, and we are witnesses of these things, and so is also the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to them that will obey him. Now, say so that was a big thing. The Re reason a lot of people would never get filled with the Spirit is if the Spirit told them to go and do something, they're not going to do it. They're kind of locked in. They got my little life. Don't bother me, Lord. I'm just like here. That's how I was. I'm principal of a school for handicapped children. And he says, I'll just sell everything you got and come follow me. It's just like those two went to, went to California on the beach. They said, we're going to leave it all behind. We're just going to go. Anyway, let me give you the last thing I'll send you, send you home. I realize this. When you get filled with the Spirit, what you're getting filled with Is the love of God. Ultimately, that's what it's all about. In, a, in uh, Romans 5, 5. And the love of God is shed abroad, or means poured out. Here, listen. And it's the love of God that is shed abroad, poured out into your hearts by the Holy Spirit given to you. Now, that's the whole key. Because that's what's the driving factor. That's what's the missing ingredient in a, lot of men, in a lot of people. They don't have that love of God in, in its depth. Because what, what moved me out from where I was to minister to others was the love of the people. That's what it was. Why do you go to, why do you go to prisons? They don't, you can't take an offering. You can't build a big church out of the prison. Why, why go to, the, to minister to the drug addicts? What, why? What exactly turns you on for that? What is it that moves you? What's the big mo in your life? And until you're filled with God's love, all of those rocks in that glass thing, that's self-life. It says, I'm not going anyplace. I like a little mediocre Christianity here. I hang out and I do. And, and you probably go to heaven. It's okay. You know, you're, you're saved. That's nice. But I say, if you want to go to the next, if you want to step over the line, go to the next thing, say, I'm going to get filled with this. And what you get filled with is the love of God. That's the pouring out. That's when they went down to the street. That's when they preached the gospel. Luke 4, 18. And the Spirit, Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because He has anointed me, Holy Ghost anointing, to do something. What is the, what is the outcome of the fullness of the Spirit and the anointing and the Shekinah glory of God? And He, he outlines it. Here's what it is. And you'll notice it's all for, the, for setting the captives free. Here's what it is. It's to preach the gospel to the poor. To preach, not to the big the affluent and be a big deal with the whole thing, but to preach the gospel to the poor. Go to the prison. Go to some place where they can, you can't take an offering. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. You know how people are brokenhearted? He said this, the anointing, the love of God is to heal those brokenhearted. 
to preach deliverance to the captives. You know how many people are captive by or in bondage to who knows? You could make a, a huge list. The cover, recovery of sight to the blind. That may be spiritual sight. It may be natural sight. But people are blinded today. They got the blinders on. They don't see. They don't even understand what's going on. So you take the blinders off. And is set at liberty those who are bruised. He said, that's what the anointing is about. That's why we want to, not to, so you can speak in tongues. And that's a wonderful thing. You know, you can speak in tongues and uh, tongues and interpretation. One of the gifts, we'll talk about that as we go along. It's a gift in the church. That's great. There's a prayer language, just a prayer life uh, to build yourself up in the Holy Ghost, you know, to build yourself and praying in tongues. But that's not why we do this. That's just part of the package. But the thing is, I want to get filled with the love of God because the Holy Spirit, he is, that is the love of God. That's what moved Jesus to the cross. That's why he gave his life. Because it wasn't about him. It was about, he looked on the people with compassion and he wept for them. We don't have a tear in our eye for the terrible things happening around us. Much less our, our move to action, not just religious fervor, but moved by the Holy Spirit, guided by the Spirit to go to the place where God has for us. You look in the book of Acts, it says, oh, we were going to so-and-so. We were going to preach the gospel over in uh, wherever, in Asia. Said, the Holy Spirit says, no, you don't go over there and preach the gospel. Actually, it's over, over here. That's where the field is. It's like Jesus, you know, they're out fishing and they're fishing and can't catch anything. He said, oh, you're on the wrong side of the boat. Go to the right side of the boat. And they pull in all the fish. Come on, being led by the Spirit. <laughs> Hallelujah. So let's go fishing. It's got to be anointed fishing. It can't just be, uh, you know, carnal fishing. You can't go just to build a church and get some more people in the pews. Anybody, you know, you can, you can water down the message and have a nice uh, uh, advertising campaign, get people in the seats. But we want to see folks that are coming and getting saved, healed, delivered. And, and uh, set free. Hallelujah. Can you say amen?